Hello everyone. Do you have a problem that just can't be solved? Have you exhausted all avenues and just can't find a way to fix your problem? Well, I have a way that you just might be able to fix it anyway. Stand by. Hello everyone, it's DJ. Have you got a problem that you just can't fix? You've tried everything in the world and you just can't seem to resolve your problem, well, there is a way that you might be able to fix it, and I'm going to teach you how to do so today. So let's say that you have a problem with your records, which is preventing you from qualifying for a benefit which you have earned. Let's say you have a problem with your records, which, okay, I won't do that. If you've seen the Police Squad TV show or the Naked Gun movie series, then you know that joke, but I won't go into that, so let's move on. Anyway, so what's happened or didn't happen, and or what has happened and, or what didn't happen, and your records show something that you are not eligible for, be it something retirement-related, you know, retirement eligibility, or a pay grade you should have, or just about anything else. Let's say you've got a problem and you just can't fix it. You've exhausted all other avenues to correct the problem and nothing's working. You might have even filed a congressional complaint, as much as I've said for or against those in the past. In fact, I would say look at my video on whether or not you should file a congressional inquiry. I'll put a link up here so you can see that. If you still have a problem, even after that much vaunted congressional inquiry, in fact, most of the time, at least from what I have seen, those don't work, what can you do? Well, there is something out there available to you. When all other attempts have failed, there is one last thing you can try. Federal law directs each branch of the military, even the Coast Guard, even though we sometimes call them the baby navy or the, or the puddle pirates. One of my blinds just fell apart. Oh well. Anyway, so even the Coast Guard, they all have what's called a Board of Corrections for Military Records, or BCMR. Specifically, the law says, and I'll read it here, the Secretary of a Military Department may correct any military record when the secretary considers it necessary to correct an error or remove an injustice. And then I have a link to the specific section of law that says that. You can find that in the notes for this particular episode. But did you notice the key statement there? The law allows the branch of service to correct not only a problem with a record, but an injustice as a result of that problem. For example, let's refer back to an episode that I had back in June of last year about the Fettinger Project, Fettinger, to properly enunciate, <clears throat> where I talked about a widow who was not receiving certain benefits. In that story, I told you about a widow whose husband had not applied for his retirement due to a debilitating illness. As a result, he never received his military retirement. Neither of them had TRICARE coverage. And when he passed away, the widow did not receive the survivor annuity. When she finally found out that there was a survivor annuity available to her, she came to me and applied for it. And, not surprisingly, Army Human Resources Command denied that request because her husband had never applied for his retirement in the first place. This is actually correct by law and their procedures. <clears throat> so, what was she to do? We knew what to do. We actually told her that the request for the survivor annuity would be denied, but we had a backup. An appeal to the Army Board for Correction of Military Records, or ABCMR, resulted in the full payment of her husband's retirement, in statement of TRICARE benefits, and her receiving the survivor annuity, all with complete back pay. This took a little while, 
but we were completely successful for her. That's the good news story. But the boards of corrections are not a magic bullet. They will not fix any problem you have. You have to have definitive proof of your claim, whatever that may be. And you must have exhausted all methods of correction first. Now, why do I keep saying that? I've said several times, exhausted everything. Why can't a person just skip all the bureaucracy and go straight to these boards? Well, let's look at the law again. And I'll read right out of Title 10 one more time. It's short, don't worry. Except when procured by fraud, a correction under this section is final and conclusive. Put simply, this means that a BCMR, a Board of Corrections, is absolutely your last resort. If you appeal to the board and you are denied, then there is no other recourse available to you. Not even that overly hyped congressional that people love to throw out there. For this reason, you have to be absolutely sure that there's no other way you can fix your problem. And when you're putting your, your appeal together, you have to do so very carefully. So I'm going to walk you through that. Now, you are quite fortunate here in that I have assisted several dozen service members and retirees with these types of appeals. And most of these appeals have been successful, the vast majority. Why were they successful? If I don't think that a case has a chance of passing the board, if it doesn't have enough merit, then I'll tell that member straight up that I don't think that it has a chance. And we'll continue working on that appeal until it has enough supporting documentation or valid arguments, whatever it might need, in order for the board to give it proper consideration. However, you have to, of course, say things the right way. For example, saying something like, I want this benefit because I deserve it, isn't going to fly. But if you say, and I wrote this out here, so let me read it, and this is just an example, I believe I am eligible for this benefit because of, and insert law or regulation or primary document reference here, and believe that the record should be amended for the sake of correctness and due justice. Then there is a much higher likelihood of success in this case. Now, I don't mean to say that you should simply use flowery words for these appeals. I mean to say you should have a well-thought-out argument and plenty of supporting documents to strengthen your position. It's just like anything in combat. You need to have a good fighting position, a good plan for your defense. It's the same with bureaucracy. You've got to think out your proposal, your argument properly, and present it the right way. So before I get any deeper on this topic, let's take a look at the actual appeal request first. It's deceptively simple, and I have an emphasis on deceptive here. There is a specific technique to doing this properly, and you have to be sure to follow that. All right, so first we see the document to request an appeal from the Board of Corrections. It is a Department of Defense Form 149. It is a one-page front and back form which appears at first glance to require you to only complete, complete the front of it to make an appeal. The back of it is just instructions and notes. Block 1 of the form asks you just for your branch of service, name, pay grade, service number if applicable, and social security number. Block 2 asks about your current status in the armed forces, such as active duty, National Guard, retired, etc. Block 3 asks about your type of discharge, if applicable, and Block 4, if you were discharged, asks about the date of discharge. Moving on, now we get to the first two areas where people typically run into problems. Blocks 5 and 6 are narrative fields, which, in the case of Block 5, 
inquire about your desired outcome of the appeal, and in block six, the nature of the error or injustice in your records. I personally think that these would make a little more sense to an applicant if the order of these questions were reversed, but that's another story. For now, let's focus on the major issue here. You can already see it. The narrative fields here are very small. There's not a lot of room to tell your story, and a great many of these cases involve a lot of detail, or they should. And this detail is needed for the board to understand everything that they need in order to make an informed decision. So, more often than not, I recommend that people attach a letter to the board explaining everything that is wrong with their records and, ex and explaining exactly how they wish the records or injustices to be resolved. Forethought and specificity are essential here because the board will often do only what you ask them to do. For example, if you wish the record to reflect your retired pay grade as E7 rather than E6, and have proof of being eligible for that grade, of course, but do not ask for your retired pay to be at the rate of E7, then there is a possibility that you will have an ID card that says E7, but you will only be paid as an E6. It has happened in the past. Therefore, do not expect the board to read your mind. Lay out exactly what you want from them and all of the justifications for what you are asking of them. Now we move on. The next section here, block seven, is quite simple. It just wants to know when the problem arose and what organization was or may have been at fault. Block eight asks you when you found out there was a problem. If you are making the appeal more than three years since that date of discovery, it then asks you why the board should consider your request. In essence, this is asking, if you didn't care enough to ask us for a correction in a timely manner, why should we devote our valuable time to fix the problem? It's a legitimate question, and you should answer it truthfully and tactfully if it applies to you. Other than the narrative blocks of five and six that I mentioned, I consider block nine to be the most essential part of this request. It is also the one on which you spend the most time. Just like blocks five and six, there is not a lot of room here. This is specifically the list of supporting documentation that is going with your appeal. So what I often end up doing is creating a list of documents to add to the completed packet and I simply put see attached document list in this block. You should only send, and keep this in mind, you should only send documents relevant to your case. Do not try to baffle the board with BS by flooding them with an abundance of paper. They will not appreciate this, and it will only delay your case because the board does look at everything you send them. They look at everything quite laboriously. So don't delay things by adding anything that's not absolutely essential to what you're trying to do. Now we move on to block 10. This gives you the option of appearing in person to defend your case. So far, I have not had a case where a personal appearance was warranted. It could happen, though. However, in the vast majority of appeals, it would be appropriate to check no. Moving on, Block 11 Alpha asks whether you have an attorney or other person representing you in this case, and if so, you should complete Blocks 11 Alpha through 11 Delta. Well, that's pretty simple. That's just the address, phone number, email address, and fax number of the representative, being an attorney or a retirement, service, retirement services officer or, or any other person. The board also asks in Block 11 Echo whether you want to have their responses in an electronic format. 
they only respond to these cases in writing. So if you want that by email rather than a hard copy, then check yes in block 11 echo. Otherwise, check no and you'll receive a hard copy response in the mail. Blocks 12 and 13 ask about specific information for the applicant. Block 12 should only be completed if the applicant is someone other than the service member. If that is the case, then you should complete all the parts of Block 12. Let's say it's a widow or widower, then in that case you would need to pr prove somehow that you have a right to appeal on behalf of the member. In this case, it would be a death certificate and the marriage certificate. But if it's another case, like you're a family member or an attorney, then you would need something like a power of attorney or proof of incompetency for that member. Anything that proves you have a right to make this request on behalf of the member. Next, we go to block 13, and that asks whether you wish to, correction, that asks for contact information for the applicant, and that should be complete contact information. So address, telephone, email, and if you have one, fax number, be sure to include all of that because they will need it. And believe it or not, we're already at the end. Finally, we get to the end of page one where the applicant signs and dates the form. And the back of the form just includes instructions and the addresses of all the branches of service. You should send a hard copy of the complete packet to the appropriate branch of service. There is also a small section for additional remarks if needed, but I recommend including these remarks as part of the letter to the board though. All right, so now let's get into some specifics on what to do, or rather, what happens next. I mentioned mailing a hard copy packet to the branch of service. Some branches of service have a way to submit an appeal online, but in this rare case, I will recommend using the hard copy method instead. The reason for this is the board will still want a signature on a form before they will, will review your case. This means you will either have to download that form from their website or wait for it to be mailed to you, sign it, and then send it back. Rather than add this delay, I recommend simply sending them the completed signed packet in the first place. Just skip all of that and send them everything they need all at once. The board should notify you when they receive the packet, just so you know it's there and in the queue for them to review later on. Now, due to the complexity of these appeals, I recommend finding someone who is experienced in putting them together and having that person assist you. There are many law offices out there that can assist, for a fee, of course, and there are often retirement services officers who are knowledgeable in this area as well. So you should seek out these people and, and get their advice prior to compiling a request for the board yourself. Now, the big question a lot of people have is how long should I wait once I have sent a packet to the board? This is surprisingly long. In the case of an Army board, they receive well over 3,000 cases per month, in, and the other branches of service are quite similar. This takes quite a long time to review, so more often than not, a case takes a year or more in order to get a response. Don't be surprised or dismayed by this. This is sadly just the way it is at the moment. Currently, there's not a way to work around this timeline. I wish there were, but sadly at the moment, there is not. Another sad note, though, is if you did have assistance from a lawyer or an RSO, retirement services officer, these people would not be able to give you any sort of update on the status of your appeal. In fact, I often 
received calls from people who have submitted cases to the board. I had two today, as a matter of fact. And sadly, the only thing I'm able to do is email the board if they have a group inbox, which can be contacted. And the only information I'm able to provide the caller after I get a response is the case number and whether or not the case is currently being reviewed. And that's it. So just keep in mind that the board will not give outsiders any other information than that. They will only communicate with the applicant. And even then, if the case is under review, all they will say is, we're reviewing it. That's all. They won't tell you anything about the status other than that until they've made a decision. They will communicate in writing once the decision is made. But that is all. There's not a phone number or direct email address that they that anyone can use to contact the boards. And in a way, this makes sense. That's because if, let's say, there was a phone number, then the boards would have to devote manpower to, to occupy those phone lines and essentially say the same thing that the few people manning the email box will say. You know, here's the case number, and it's under review. So for the sake of efficiency, there's only that review, or rather that inbox, that email inbox, to get that scant bit of information. I, again, I wish there were other ways to get additional info for people, because they do get antsy the longer they have to wait. Sadly, that's all there is at the moment. Overall, the Boards of Correction can be a bit frustrating for applicants due to this long timeline, this long wait time, but these boards are the only way, in many cases, to fix the problems they have. I ask everyone who makes use of these boards to please exercise some patience and wait for the decision from the board. Now, once that decision finally arrives, the applicant will find a very detailed description of what the members of the board found in the appeal packet, what the applicant requested, the points of law and regulation that were considered, and the final decision by the board. The decision is usually one of three things, three little things. Usually it is to fully grant the request of the applicant or to partially grant the request of the applicant, or in some cases to deny the request. If the request was fully or partially granted, then that decision is also forwarded to other appropriate government agencies for them to action. And at that point, it becomes yet another waiting game for the applicant as those agencies work through the case in their own particular way. Every agency works differently, have their own timelines, their own workflow, so we have to deal with that as well. So, in 20 minutes, we have gone through a quick, although some might say agonizing, overview of the Boards of Corrections. I hope this has been an understandable description of how the boards work and how you can apply to them. I have included some useful references in the resources section of this episode. One of them is a guide from the Army Board for applicants to use in putting together their appeals packets, and I believe that, as well as the other resources, will be of great value to you. So that's all for this week. I do thank you for devoting your time to this episode. If you believe this information or other episodes that I have in the inventory are useful, either for you or for other people, I ask that you share this information with others. If you are not already subscribed, then of course, wrong way, I, I ask that you click on the RC Retirement logo down here at the bottom of the screen. Have you noticed I always point in the wrong direction for some weird reason? But subscribe to this channel. If you're listening to this in podcast form, please subscribe to the podcast. I also have a written article version of this, which we'll post on Friday. You can share that with people as well, for those who like the written word over the spoken or videographic versions. 
There are all kinds of ways to consume this content. So again, if you believe this information is useful, then please share it with others so that they can learn how to improve themselves and make use of their benefits as well. Please keep in mind that there are other formats of this show out there that I mentioned a podcast and a written form of a lot of my content. There's also a radio program which airs on Sunday afternoons at 1630 Eastern Standard Time. It is a shortwave program that airs on 7780 kilohertz. If you do not have a shortwave radio, then you can go to rcretirement.com and click on several Amazon affiliate links for some affordable shortwave radios. You'll also find, as they're needed, information about the show. And if you go to rcretirement.com slash radio, you'll even find SoundCloud archives of all the episodes of the radio program so far. So, again, that's all we have for this week. I do thank you for being part of this audience and spending your time with me. As always, most of all, I thank you for your service and look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day. If you liked what you heard on today's episode, then please go below and give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to this channel. Also, please let other people know about this channel and the information it can provide for them. If you have questions or comments, then have no qualms about posting them in the comments section below. Please remember the RC Retirement YouTube channel and the RC Retirement website are not recognized or endorsed by the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, or any other government agency. The information presented in these resources are for entertainment and informational purposes only. Also, the content of either of these resources should not be considered financial or legal advice. Please consult with your own legal counsel, accountant, and financial planner before making any decisions based on what you have learned here. As always, thank you for watching the RC Retirement YouTube channel.